Good morning, everybody. I acknowledge the country on which each of us joined from today. I join you from the land of the Gadigal and the Eora and pay my respects to elders past and present. I also acknowledge my First Nations and my non-Indigenous brothers and sisters joining us today. My name is Carly Warner, a Palawa woman, and I also have the privilege of being the current CEO of the Aboriginal Legal Service of New South Wales and the ACT. I'm joined today by my colleague, Gemma Slacksmith, Principal Solicitor of our Care and Protection and Family Law team. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting today's webinar event with Bill Pritchard, a proud Wiradjuri man and the Acting Executive Leader at APSEC. Our webinar today has been supported by the UTS Jambana Institute, and we're joined by Paul Gray, who will assist in facilitating some of the Q&A later on. Some housekeeping, we are recording the session to share later. Please use the chat if you would like to make comments and of course, always keep them respectful. We invite you to submit questions for our panelists using the Q&A window. Of course, we'll aim to get to as many of these as we can, but just keep in mind, we've got some phenomenal speakers today and so um, time is always of the essence. A year now has passed since the release of the Family as Culture Report, an independent review into Aboriginal children and young people in the out-of-home care system in New South Wales. I acknowledge the work of the grandmothers and the community advocates who challenged the New South Wales Government to undertake this review. Led by Cobble Cobble Aboriginal woman, Professor Megan Davis, the Family as Culture Review looked uh, at young people um, and the individual circumstances of more than a thousand Aboriginal children and young people who were removed from their parents in 2015 to 2016. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Davis and two of her colleagues, Dr. Althea Gibson and Emma Buxton at Namasnik, to talk about the findings and the recommendations of the Family as Culture Report and the government's response. Following their presentation, you'll hear from Bill and myself about some of the actions that ABSEC and the ALS are urgently calling for to deliver better outcomes for Aboriginal children, families and our communities. I note that Professor Davis and Bill will need to leave a little early during our session, so I just want to thank them in advance for their contributions. I welcome our presenters, Professor Megan Davis. It is a great pleasure to have you here. Professor Davis is the Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous and Professor of Law at UNSW. She is Acting Commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court and was recently appointed to the Balnaves Chair in Constitutional Law. She was a member of the Referendum Council and the Experts Panel on the Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution was an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues from 2011 to 2016, and is currently a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People. Professor Davis is also a commissioner on the Australian Rugby League Commission, and like any good Queenslander, she supports the North Queensland Cowboys and the Queensland Maroons. Emma Buxton Namasnik. Emma has a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws from Macquarie University, a Master of Criminal Justice and Criminology from the University of New South Wales, and a Master of Studies in International Human Rights Law from the University of Oxford. Emma is currently in the final stages of a Doctor of Philosophy in Criminology and Human Rights at the University of Oxford, where her research examines the issues of state responses to intimate partner violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Emma has extensive experience in qualitative and quantitative data analysis and legal research and has applied these skills working in roles on the New South Wales Domestic Violence Death Review Team, the Family is Culture Review and as an independent research consultant. Dr Althea Gibson, Althea has a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Laws and a Master of Laws from the University of New South Wales, as well as a Doctor of Philosophy uh, Law from the University of Technology, Sydney. After her admission as a legal practitioner in 2001, uh, Dr Gibson worked as a solicitor for the New South Wales uh, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and for Spark Helmore Lawyers. 
later she moved into the Australian Law Reform Commission where she was involved in a number of national inquiries into federal laws and practices. Most recently, she worked as a senior legal researcher on the Family as Culture Review. Um, we're joined, as you can see, by an incredible um, amount of talent and panellists. And I want to hand now over to Professor Davis and her team for their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, and um, I've, I've spoken to my colleagues and, um, and also the kind introduction to my, my team. I, I really did have an exceptional team. And we worked on this report and this inquiry for over two years, doing the deep dive into these um, young people and children's files. And um, the report wouldn't be as robust and thorough if it wasn't for Althea and M. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just provide some open introductory comments, Carly, and then I'll um, I'll hand it over to Al and Emma to 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 um, to continue. Um, on any of the issues that I, I, I didn't raise. And we're, we're really acutely aware of the time, so we'll, we'll try and stick to that. Um, but um, we will, we're very happy to provide the PowerPoint to people listening today. Um, as Carly said, I led the um, Families Culture Review into Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. Um, this, this review was as a consequence of, as, as we all know, the activism, the very important activism of um, grandmothers um, against uh, removals um, and, um, and of course the advocacy um, in particular of um, ABSEC and other organisations. But in, but in particular, when I met with Brad Hazard, it was the, um, the grandmothers campaign that had really, um, I think, um, uh, led to this review being uh, uh, established. Um, and in particular, the really important um, Our Kids, Our Way uh, forum. One of the things I'd like to say from the outset is that grandmothers and, and um, mothers and a lot of people have said at the time, a number of things about the New South Wales um, child protection system, the out of home care system, um, and the department that that to many at that point sounded quite outlandish, but it's really important to, to, to make the point and we make the point in the report that many of the uh, assertions that were made about the system um, were validated through this inquiry. Um, things like the gaslighting of families by caseworkers in the department, um, the, the, the trauma that is inflicted upon families when their children um, enter into um, um, come to the attention of the department and into um, out of home care. Um, things like the um, what one can only describe as discrimination um, um, and, and absolute unfairness and non transparency in care assessments. Um, I was really, my team, we were really moved by the numbers of um, Aboriginal parents and grandparents and family who put their hands up to seek to care. Um, for for their mob, for their kin, um, and the door is shut in their face um, without any assessment occurring. I um, mean, it was very heartbreaking to see the numbers of files in which families' phone calls don't get returned. Um, so that that's a really important point to make. Other things such as grandmothers and others talking about the way in which um, the department would lie to the court um, and, and that was, I think, in terms of the rule of law and, and Aboriginal trust and faith in, in, in our public institutions, um, to be fair and to be transparent, that, that is the most difficult thing to, to stomach. Um, a lot of people said that misinformation, that children were moved, removed on misinformation and inaccuracy, and I mean, it was really frustrating for them to see, um, you know, fabrications and confections being conveyed to the court. Um, and, 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 and we saw many cases of that being validated as well. And, and that all that does is entrench that sense of powerlessness. Um, so I just wanted to make that point to say that much of what was said um, was validated and, and that speaks to the importance of the collective work and collective voices of our people to get change. Now the change was um, uh, effectively meant to come through this independent review where we did a two year deep dive into about 1,150, <laughs> thanks Al, my, my old brains. I'm like, how many files did it end up with? 
um, because we had to make sure they were all um, accurate. I think it ended up being 1,144 files. Um, where um, we looked at everything um, in, in the files to elicit whether or not, um, we'll elicit a number of things, um, uh, but in particular, the kind of casework um, that had occurred with um, a particular family. We wanted to look at what kind of early prevention work had, had been done and early intervention work um, and, and get a sense of whether it was um, a, a fair decision that the child had been um, removed. Um, and so um, it was a very substantial um, report um, and inquiry. Um, we, we, as I said, I, we did the case file reviews. We also sought submissions and consultations. Um, we did a lot of yarning circles and we also visited a number of sites and interviewed families. Um, and we had a reference group as well. And in addition to that, um, we collected and analysed a lot of qualitative and quantitative data, thanks to our statistician and data guru, Emma, who is on the call right now. Um, so it was a very substantial um, report. But the, I suppose in my open, opening remarks, I wanted to um, applaud you for holding this webinar because um, we don't believe there's been an appropriate response to the review. Um, you know, I think I found out that there was a formal response to the review last year, the day before or the day of, I was informed, um, um, which is quite astounding. And then I didn't hear about this progress report until a few days ago, I think. Um, and um, I think that speaks to something that we talk about in the re report, and it is something that I think needs to be front of mind when we think about the, um, the recommendations, uh, the implementation of the recommenda recommendations and how to take this forward in terms of reform. And that is the, the kind of ritualism that is just imbued in the department. We speak about regulatory ritualism in, in the report. I think it's an important lens to keep in mind. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the idea um, that large bureaucracies such as um, the department, they develop cultures um, that, are, that are kind of parallel universes um, to the way the world should and does work. Um, and so in this case, this very large bureaucracy develops their own culture and they become indifferent or resistant to the intention of legislators. I use this framework of regulatory ritualism because um, it's, a, it's a framework that has been adopted by different countries to understand why bureaucracies go, do the things that they do, um, lose sight of the work that they're meant to be doing. And it's very common in, in countries with um, regulatory systems. So this is a regulatory system because the child protection system, the out of home care system is regulated by an act. And, um, and even though you can have the best principles like the Aboriginal child placement principle embedded in an act, um, what happens on the ground, on the ground, street level, is that the department loses all sight of what's in, what's effectively in the regulatory statute, um, and um, things go off the rails. So ritualism, as you can see on this slide, says it's an acceptance of institutionalised means for securing regulatory goals, um, and that is in Australia very commonly. We've seen this, so we, we've seen examples of this in multiple sites in Australia, whether it's um, the Banking Royal Commission, for example, is a really good um, example of the way in which we have big statutes in Australia that regulate a system. Um, and then you have a department that implements that regulatory framework. And it's the department that lose, loses sight of what those, um, you know, parliamentary regulatory goals were in the first place. And I think that's most um, evident and our people understand ritualism the most when it comes to the implementation of the child, Aboriginal child placement principle. I mean, what we found categorically in our review is that um, caseworkers in the department don't understand what the Aboriginal child placement principle is or what it, how it's meant to be implemented. Um, and that was really clear through that deep dive into all of these files. Um, and, um, and partly because there's a really poor understanding of culture there's a really poor understanding of Aboriginal people. 
Um, but also a lot of people I spoke to didn't even understand the racial segregation era. They didn't understand the Protection Act. They didn't understand the location of townships that were former reserves and missions. There was just a lack of understanding of Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture and the geography of Aboriginal people in New South Wales. Now, you can't work in this space if you don't understand Aboriginal history. You should not be working in this space. So, so the ritualism occurs because when you look, when you go into the department and you go and visit different places, there's all these wonderful dot paintings and posters and Aboriginal children's faces and references to the placement principle and to culture. So it's listed in everything, the multiple policies, the meeting notes, the brochures, the forms, it's everywhere. But, but what you see is it's actually non-compliance of the Aboriginal child placement principle. And it's very similar to the way the language of the right to self-determination is deployed. Um, I, you know, I sit on a UN United Nations body as an expert member um, of, on the rights of Indigenous peoples in Geneva. I've been a UN expert for 10 years and worked at the UN for 20 years. I can't see any evidence of the right to self-determination in the system, but the language is which really loosely de deployed by departments and bureaucracies, despite the fact that there is actually no um, or very little infrastructure in Australia that tells us that the right to self-determination is implemented. In a, in a federation like Australia, where the Commonwealth really trumps all, um, if you don't have self-determination at the Commonwealth level, then what does it look like at a state level? So constant, the word, the language of consultation, the language of participation, that, that is not the same thing as self-determination. So they're, they're, they are two different things. And so there's too much of a com conflation of the language of um, self-determination, uh, sorry, of, of consultation participation with self-determination. They are not the right, the, they're the same thing. So um, I, I, I'll just kind of try and wrap it up so that I can hand it to uh, my colleagues to, to really take um, us through a more thorough overview of the report. But I just wanted to say, you know, we um, as a family is culture team are disappointed um, at the, the way in which the recommendations are being implemented. Um, you know, while we welcome the appointment of a deputy child guardian, that is a form of ritualism. So we know that these mechanisms are toothless and aren't doing their jobs. Um, appointing more doesn't make it, you know, better. Um, so um, so we, we, we have been very dis disappointed by that. Um, at first glance, um, I would say it's a pretty disingenuous response to the report. We, there are very, very thorough recommendations and specific recommendations that we took a long time to craft. Um, and there's a bit of cherry picking in relation um, to those recommendations. But more importantly, um, the response seems to be a lot of ritualism. So there's a lot of convening of meetings to discuss. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we will commit to and we will endeavour to do this. And there's a lot of talk, but it's, that's all the ritualism of departments, right? More meetings, more discussions and more kicking the can down the road on, on the substantive changes, the structural reform that is required to change this system. And, and one of the key things about changing the system is just the lack of accountability for poor practice. You know, it's one of the few professions in the world, and we looked at professions um, in many contexts, in many professions. It's one of the few professions where you can make profoundly wrong and incorrect decisions and nothing happens to you. Yet the implications of your poor practice for a young person or a child is a lifetime of trauma and dislocation from their family and insecurity. It's, it's astounding that this exists. So that structural form and the recommendations around accountability, um, we did make because the accountability is not there. And I make this point time and time again, even in the context of my constitutional work, they do not do things out of the goodness of their heart. You have to have things enshrined in law to force them to do it and to mandate them to do things. And I think um, my team picked up in the kind of analysis of the progress report that really the only thing they've mandated is that case workers have to put the first nation of the child or young person on child story that, now that that's um that is a step right because we were astounded that information about young people and their people and their mob and their um 
and their their country is not recorded anywhere. Um, and 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 for departments, they probably say you know incremental steps, baby steps. Um, but it is um, it is disappointing. It's um, as Emma said, very low hanging fruit that is actually being um, implemented. So I think I'll um, end there and um, hand it over to my colleagues. Um, and I'll just wait on until I have to move off to my next uh, meeting and they'll walk you through the core recs. Okay, thanks, Megan. I'll just uh, take over from um, the, and talk about the uh, issue of accountability. Um, we, after looking at all the mechanisms that currently exist in the child protection space to provide that, you know, much needed element of accountability, we concluded that they, they weren't operating effectively and we made a number of recommendations to increase transparency is a, is it was a big factor and accountability um, of caseworker um, on the ground practice. Uh, as like Megan said, a lot of the times the problem was not the, the policy or the legislation or the guidance that was given to caseworkers or the structural decision making tool. A lot of the time the problem was uh, that all of those uh, instruments to guide caseworker decision making were quite simply ignored. Um, our, and so our main flagship reform that we recommended was an independent statutory body to oversee and monitor the child protection system in New South Wales. And we listed the functions for, for that body and it was basically an amalgamation of the functions of all the existing bodies that are currently working in the space that, um, you know, have... MOUs with how they interact with each other and divvy up different areas of the child protection system. We recommended they all be consolidated um, and importantly that this be independent. Uh, the other recommendations you can see there on the slide were all about um, you know, addressing transparency. Uh, the internal complaints handling system. Um, currently we heard a lot of people um, are very afraid to complain to the department, are afraid of being blacklisted. Uh, there's the power imbalance between caseworkers and Aboriginal um, people involved in the child protection system was really apparent. And so we've recommended an overhaul of that complaints handling system. Um, you can see other recommendations there. I probably don't have time to go through them all, but um, basically, uh, you know, the, the main structural reforms we recommended in the report were um, related to self-determination and accountability. And in the report, we say if those two main issues are dealt with properly, we'll go, it will go a long way to reducing the number of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. But I'll move on to a bit more of the detailed reforms. Um, I might just skip early intervention because we really aren't going to have time to talk through all of these, but we've kept all the slides here um, and can forward them later um, if anyone would like to look at them. But Em, I'll hand over to you for this one. Sure, thanks Al. Um, so prenatal uh, reporting and newborn removals was another area of particular concern that arose in the review and nearly a fifth of the Aboriginal children who entered care in our cohort uh, entered care before they were six months of age. 10% of those children entered before uh, they were two weeks old. So the review found that um, as unfortunately as we expected that there were some serious deficiencies in casework in almost all cases involving newborn removals. So it was common that mothers would be subject to a high risk birth alert but there would be limited or no supports provided during the pregnancy to attempt to support the mother or prevent that child being removed after the birth. So for instance, in one of our cases, there were nine reports made about the child prior to his birth. However, um, no steps were taken to work with the child's parents at this critical time. And the caseworker was only assigned to the case after the child was born facts informed the child's family that they would be consulted before the child was taken into care, but this didn't happen. Uh, the child was assumed into care at the hospital, despite facts being informed by the child's grandmother that this did not need to happen as there were family members willing and able to care for the child. 
So this issue was was something that um, I think was was really troubling to the review and and all of us who were working on it. And uh, one of the areas we looked at in response to this issue was uh, an urgent need for intensive and trauma support informed uh, support for mothers who are pregnant. Uh, and you know this is a, a relatively easy uh, cohort to work with but also um, the need for trauma support after children are removed as well. And this leads into a uh, concern that the review had around the availability uh, and, and possibility of restoration and whether or not the department was actively supporting parents uh, when it came to restoring children. So, I might just move to restoration, Althea, because there are some um, obviously very important slides in between, uh, but I think that given time, we might move through to the kind of the issues of restoration and also uh, the children's court, because this is of particular relevance to Aboriginal legal services, I would say. Um, so the review identified that there were really considerable barriers to restoration for parents and families who had children removed by the department. And achieving restoration was an impossibility for many families and children um, in the cohort. And this was often because restoration was um, opposed very early by the department and uh, restoration goals where they were provided were often impossible for parents to achieve both uh, in terms of the goals themselves, but also the time frame that was put on um, for achieving those goals before um, final orders were made. So there were issues identified in the ways in which the, average, uh, the, the department was working with Aboriginal families uh, and communicating with Aboriginal families around expectations for restoration. Often goals were very unclear, even if, uh, if they were provided, and in many cases they weren't. And uh, this really, I think, showed the review and, and all of us working on it that uh, there was a very significant barrier. Children were being removed very uh, quickly and early without uh, sufficient support for families before the removal. But then once children were removed, it was very, very difficult for families to get those children back in their care. So to uh, kind of respond to this, uh, we made a number of recommendations around uh, restoration and in particular really emphasising that this should be the goal. Uh, for the department and for families. Uh, and it appeared to us that restoration was really the preferred position after removal when it came to Aboriginal children who had entered out of home care. So just moving to the next slide, uh, Megan has already touched on this um, in respect of the children's court, but in a really significant proportion of the cases that came before our review, there was evidence that facts provided the children's court with misleading or untrue evidence when it came to uh, care proceedings for children in that jurisdiction. So given that facts as evidence was then used to remove Aboriginal kids from their families and communities, it was extremely concerning to us that this evidence was contradicted by other um, information that we had available to us from the files. So misleading or untrue evidence presented by fax lawyers to the court ranged from unfavorable readings uh, of favorable readings of the department's actions uh, to negative patently untrue and damaging incorrect evidence around the children's parents. Uh, and this was identified as a really appalling uh, abuse of power and highlighted an issue of transparency and also accountability within the legal services of the department. And this is something I think that sits alongside those accountability recommendations that Althea discussed a little bit earlier around um, encouraging greater transparency within the process. And as a consequence, one of the key recommendations of the review was um, the creation of an independent statutory body to conduct care and protection litigation in New South Wales. So removing that legal function from the department and the department's lawyers and, and making that more a transparent and rigorous process. So I think given the time, we might need to move to the last slide, which is around um, uh, the government response. And Althea, did you want to discuss this? Uh, 
Yeah, look, um, I'm just looking at the time too. Uh, this was the initial government response, um, it, which we, was released on the 10th of July, which was only 3.5 page response, and which, it, which had very limited analysis or um, response to the vast, vast majority of our recommendations. Um, we have, I have just, become aware of um, the updated response and and to be honest I haven't um, had the opportunity to really look at that in detail um, but there, there does seem to be a more um, detailed response but again I don't I, I don't believe that it addresses the vast majority of our recommendations um, and in relation to the care and protection act all of the recommendations that we made to for amendments to that act um, have been deferred to a review of the act that's going to commence by 2024 i think um, and so yeah might just leave it there and and hand over to um to the next speaker to pick up on on uh, the government's response in a bit more detail i just well thank you everyone thank you professor megan uh, and uh... And Anthea and Emma, uh, <coughs> Bill Pritchard from uh, Abstec here. I'm just sitting outside the doctor's surgery and I might be called in for my appointment uh, very shortly. So if I leave, I, I apologise. Um, and that's, I've been back at Abstec uh, for about six months now. Uh, and I actually came back from the department. I was CEO for, um, at Abstec for about seven years. Uh, prior to that, um, prior to going back to the department, so I've seen the, uh, I've seen it from both sides, the NGO side and the and the government side, and it's, uh, I know which side I'd rather be on. Um, <coughs> I'd like to, um, I'm I'm a Radjuri man, and I'm speaking to you from Radjuri country today, um, and I too want to acknowledge the the efforts of the grandmothers in bringing this to uh, a head with uh, Minister Hazard. And uh, also, I want to thank the ALS and uh, um, and Jambana for the, their partnership in this uh, in this ongoing uh, quest to get some justice. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the uh, our other partners. And if you look on, on our website and our media releases, there's actually a list of all those agencies, uh, non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal, that have been supporting us. And the other peaks, in Coss and Aqua and FAMS, they're, they're fully on board. It's good to see non-Aboriginal people going, yes, this is the way, the way forward. Um, <clears throat> there's been, a, a, I suppose, uh, an interesting time. We waited uh, quite a while before there was any action at all on uh, um, the response. And uh, when the response came, I think our our response to the response was that it was underwhelming um, and we we're grateful about the deputy um, um, uh, deputy uh, guardian but our our concern is that it it is really at the back end um, of the uh, child protection spectrum we really need uh, uh, a commissioner um, as we mentioned uh, other states have independent Aboriginal commissioners, um, even Queensland now. Who would think that beat us, uh, beat us at football and they've beaten us to getting a commissioner? And where the commissioner has have been Im implemented, there's been significant improvements uh, in outcomes and the sky hasn't fallen in. The, child, the government uh, hasn't uh, lost their statutory authority, they've just had oversight and they've done things better. A couple of other uh, recommendations that came through early on was the knowledge circle. We sit on that. We've got two seats on it. We're not terribly sure what the, well, I'm not terribly sure what the role and the influence is. It, it's advising the minister. And I will say Minister Ward has actually committed um, to the, the implementation, but there's no time frames around that uh, the implementation other than in the public facing document that was released a few days ago um, which we didn't have any input in and, and community didn't have any input into um, we would have thought that uh, 
priorities would have been would have come from the community, uh, given the uh, recommendations around self determination and and planning. But that doesn't seem to be happening. We don't want a, a scattergun approach. We want a plan that actually will fit with the needs of the communities. Um, I, th I just think uh, we need to actually go back uh, a little bit and start consult with our communities, consult with our people, consult with our families about what they need um, in the first instance. Uh, I know Professor Megan's uh, Davis's report has highlighted uh, flaws in the system, but it, um, the government doesn't seem to be able to uh, actually work out what will work and when. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Aligned to the um, aligned to the independent commissioner is data, data sovereignty. We struggle to be able to do our work as an independent P um, in that we struggle to get data. Uh, we don't we don't ask it, and we get some data, we get numbers, but we don't get a lot of the definitive data that would make it easier for us to actually advocate and do our our work. <laughs> Again, other states are working towards that. New Zealand has a control of all their um, Maori data sovereignty. Um, and again, it, the world hasn't fallen apart over there. And uh, I think we should be led by good models uh, that are suitable for our, our people here in, in New South Wales. But in saying that, it has to be developed here by the communities, by the families and, uh, and by Aboriginal people of New South Wales. It's, I think for too long, I, I'm going back to the keep them safe days. I was there then, I had some hopes around uh, um, how things were going to be done. And, but I found there was too many projects developed that, and they're not supported. I know we uh, skipped over the TEI, but one of my, um, I suppose, priorities is around early intervention. Um, and appropriate early intervention and intervention that sits individual communities. Uh, what works in uh, Sydney may, won't work in Burke or Bree. Um, we need to have actually tailored systems of early intervention and family support. And, and I've been banging on about this for, for um, many years. Um, I was disappointed that there was no actual um, dedicated funding in the New South Wales budget um, to the implementation of the Families Culture Report. So it seems that everything's going to be done out of um, fact, the DCJ's current budget, which is always going to be a struggle to implement new efficient programs. Um, early intervention, it, it not only gives better results for our, and family support, not only gives better results for our families and communities, and I've said this so many times, you send, spend $10 million here, you're gonna save a billion dollars down the year. Because sometimes I see is the government takes humanity out of program delivery. It's all about money and how much it's going to cost and um, you know how we can report on it. And where we're not actually seeing the benefits of having appropriate, culturally appropriate programs. <coughs> and uh, I'm sorry, I'm actually losing my voice. That's why I'm here from the, uh, here from the, see the doctor. But I see this, if we don't move forward quickly, we see this as an opportunity um, that's going to be missed. I thought this was the greatest opportunity um, ever in the child, Aboriginal child protection uh, sector. Um, and I'm, I'm actually starting to lose faith. Um, I think we need to, and I, I, we're going to actually start making a more more noise and a more public campaign, and we're going to be calling on support um, from the sector, and and more and more broadly as well from the communities, um, because I think if we don't start uh, now. We've waited too long already. It'll just slide off the table, and it won't go anywhere. And I I really do think this is the time to do it. Uh, I've. It's very really difficult to believe that it's a year since that report come, has come out and what has actually happened. Um, I, I'll leave it there because, I, like I say, I'm actually losing my voice. Um, 
and I do have to actually go in in one minute's time, and and I have a very uh, strict receptionist here. So um, thank you, everybody. If you um, at the end of this uh, slide, there'll be some links to our media releases and actually an, e an email where you can uh, um, email any additional questions you might have. Uh, Solange is online if you've got any uh, questions about uh, how to contact us or what, what else is available and what else we're up to. So I thank you for your time and especially thank Megan Davis's team for the uh, great piece of work they did. Uh, in putting this forward and we're right behind um, the implementation and any help we can get will always be appreciated. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to Professor Davis and her team for the incredibly valuable presentation um, and, and to Bill for his thoughts just now on how um, on ABSEC's priorities for reform but also on the need for all of us um, to push forward together. We know that our children thrive when they're connected with culture, identity and community. Um, and, and yet today, as Bill's been highlighting, um, governments continue to separate Aboriginal children from their families and communities and culture at vastly disproportionate rates. The report, the Family as Culture report last year, laid out a really clear blueprint for reform with a focus on self-determination, transparency and early intervention. And I know Professor Davis's points around the conflation of consultation and participation with self-determination. Look, to date, um, the ALS has been disappointed by the extent of the government's response. One of the key issues that I wanted to highlight um, from the Families Culture Report is the issue of care criminalisation. Um, that is the strong link between involvement in the out-of-home care system and future contact with the criminal legal system. Every day in our work at the ALS, we see the consequences of this. Aboriginal children in New South Wales um, are currently 11 times more likely to be removed from their families. And we know that children and young people who have been involved in that child protection system are too often then forced into the quicksand of the youth justice system. And I think it is worth noting that um, such a, a phenomenal report, um, and it is not the first report or inquiry to highlight this issue, um, of the 99 Aboriginal people whose deaths were examined by the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, almost half had experienced childhood separation from their family um, through intervention by the state and other institutions. Um, we need adequate resourcing for early intervention, prevention and family support. And I know as Professor Davis and her team um, have outlined and the Families Culture Report found, in New South Wales there continues to be a lack of investment in the early intervention and prevention. Um, it, it's the experience of the ALS that improving outcomes for families depends on the extent to which they are engaged in the prevention and the early intervention activities. Um, however, within New South Wales, there is a lack of mandated early intervention, prevention engagement with families and the ALS is calling for an urgent investment. Um, we were also quite disappointed um, to hear that the legislative reforms are being pushed back until 2024. We have to prioritise the implementation of legislative amendments proposed by the Families Culture Review, developed in partnership with Aboriginal community representatives. Um, some of the key legislative amendments from our perspective include the introduction of legislative amendments to incorporate active efforts. So there should be greater legal requirements placed on the department to undertake early intervention casework with a family prior to the removal of a child. New South Wales should consider adopting legislative provisions that are similar to the active efforts requirements under the Indian Child Welfare Act in the USA. And, and on that, I just want to highlight um, one particular matter, and there are many, of course, as the Families Cultural Report highlighted, but one particular matter that the ALS um, acted in as a child representative, um, it was a matter involving the assumption of 
a, a newborn baby um, from hospital into the care system. So removed from um, the mother. The mother was a, a young teenage girl who was herself placed in out of home care. And the department determined that the child should be removed from the mother's care months before the child was born. Um, in order to assume the child into care, um, the order made reference to the mother's moderate intellectual disability and the father's intellectual disability. And the fact that he lived in a household that the secretary had received a number of um, risk of significant harm reports for including and pertaining to neglect and condition of his residence. However, the order to assume the child into care made no reference of the mother's participation in antenatal care or the supports that were available to her um, for foster care, even though there had been positive reports from the hospital regarding the mother's parenting ability. Um, nonetheless, the department relied on historical references to the mother um, absconding and staying with the paternal grandfather prior to her pregnancy. Um, ultimately, the Children's Court Magistrate um, was clear that there was in fact very positive evidence of the mother's parenting ability and therefore the child was, was not in need of care and protection. And another way to say this is that the child should not have been removed from that mother. Um, he rejected the argument given by the department that the child would be in need of care and protection had the department not put any arrangements in place, arguing that the department had, had not put in place anything substantially different than what the mother had always intended, that is for the child to be discharged into her care. And I think really for us what this highlights is that um, the risk factors weren't properly assessed. Um, there was a lack of um, impartial evidence presented uh, to the court and if that early intervention and prevention support had it been provided to mum, then Bub would have absolutely stayed um, with their family, safe in culture and, and out of this system. Um, we also, in terms of legislative requirements, really want to see a requirement for the court to take into account the harm to Aboriginal children from them being removed when it is determining risk to a child and also the mandatory use of early intervention legal tools that promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children remaining with their families and within their communities to avoid a situation that that young mum and bub had to go through. And whilst the New South Wales government, as I said, has signalled an intention to consider legislative reform, um, this is not gonna be until 2024, and this is really deeply concerning. While we wait, thousands of Aboriginal children and young people will be adversely affected by these known shortcomings in the legislative framework that are contrary to the basic principle that children are safest when supported to remain with family and connected to culture. We will continue to advocate for a suite of legislative reform developed in consultation with, with other Aboriginal organisations and, and communities um, and I really want those considered in a shorter time frame. Um, I can see that there has been some great um, questions coming through and so I'm going to hand over to Paul Gray from uh, UTS Jambana and thanks Paul. Good morning everyone um, and thank you Professor Davis uh, and her team, um, Althea and Emma, um, for a fantastic presentation and overview uh, and also to Carly and to Bill for the uh, um, you know the perspective of uh, the relevant Aboriginal peaks in the area. Um, there's been a, a huge number of questions and I want to thank Megan uh, and her team for their very comprehensive answers in the chat. Um, these, these questions have uh, covered a whole range of topics um, about um, the relative greater scrutiny and expectations that are often placed on Aboriginal staff in the department uh, and the heavy lifting that they're expected to do. Um, uh, whether there are jurisdictions in Australia that are uh, effectively tackling the issue of ritualism in the child protection space. 
um, uh, you know, the need for a broader conversation about some of the changes that uh, Professor Davis and the team proposed around the children's court uh, and things like that. So I appreciate, um, unfortunately, it feels like a, quite a one-sided conversation, I think, for many um, uh, participants who may not have been able to see the questions um, that were pitched to the um, panellists. Um, but I thank Megan for, and her team for those great responses. Um, if there are other questions, we, we have a couple of minutes. Um, and so can I encourage you to use the Q&A down the bottom uh, if there are any questions and I'll be happy to pitch those um, to the audience, uh, to the panel. Um, and I think, you know, while we wait for those to come in, um, you know, I, I suppose I was reflecting on what Carly and what um, Bill was saying about um, the importance for action in this space. Um, and so I, I suppose I want to reiterate to everyone um, while we wait for the questions that we, that this is just one point uh, in, in a conversation um, that, you know, as Professor Davis noted, uh, many grandmo uh, grandmothers and others started quite a long time ago uh, in advocating for uh, our, you know, um, their grandkids uh, and our kids and our, um, and our families. Um, and through Megan, uh, Professor Davison's very comprehensive report. Um, and now it's about, you know, um, the moral obligation now is to do something about it. Uh, we know what the problems are. Uh, we know the structural changes that are needed to the system. Uh, and so we're really keen in pushing the conversation forward uh, and holding government to account in terms of responding effectively to the uh, roadmap presented by Professor Davison and her team. Um, so we have a question um, from Rick, um, directed, I think, at you, Carly, in the ALS, um, uh, noting the great position of your field officers um, throughout the state um, and, and asking if um, there is scope there or opportunity for some of those officers to support in the development of cultural plans uh, alongside parents. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And I'm going to also bring in um, Gemma on this one. Thanks for the question, Rick. Um, I mean, I'll sort of start, start by saying, despite the critical role that the Aboriginal Legal Service plays in um, supporting children, young people and their families uh, to prevent kind of kids being removed and also once they have been removed to be pushing for restoration, it is absolutely the case that we are not in all of the locations that the ALS needs to be when it comes to our care and protection and our family law team. Um, the ALS needs to be adequately funded to ensure that we can even be at all of um, the, the Aboriginal lists that are occurring throughout New South Wales. And I'm gonna hand over to Gemma as the um, principal solicitor from our care and protection um, practice to go a little bit further into that and perhaps to respond in relation to cultural plans. Mm. So in th thanks for that, Carly, um, and for the question, Rick. Um, in relation to cultural plans, um, it's mandated now in the children's court that every child should have a cultural plan, um, and that is developed in consultation with parents and extended family members. So, well, in theory, it should be. Um, so I guess to answer the question, yes, we do assist parents. Um, where we're representing parents, we absolutely assist them in being able to engage in that process and develop um, cultural plans. Of course, a cultural plan before the Children's Court is a plan that is uh, time and place specific. So in terms of what happens thereafter is really a matter of casework and continuing casework with that family. So unfortunately, we don't have um, great scope to go beyond the children's court process unless we get some update reports in terms of Section 82 reports or, or the like. So, um, so the role is, I guess, um, somewhat limited in terms of being able to, I think the second part of the question was about whether that could, whether we, whether it assists in terms of children engaging in that process and it's something that's beyond 
um, the litigation process and is not legally based, I guess, for our, for our purposes at least. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Gemma and Carly. Um, we have two somewhat related questions, so I'm going to uh, sort of pitch them together. Um, so from Fiona Allison uh, and also from Jazz Kalen uh, from the Lismore, Lismore GMAR crew. So uh, I want to acknowledge those guys and the work that they're doing up in their community. Um, so and the, the question is about how can um, uh, the law be used um, to hold um, to hold the system to account, I guess, to hold um, child protection systems to account. So Fiona asks about um, provisions within the child, leg child protection legislation, um, but also through discrimination uh, mechanisms and civil law um, to address the issues um, that bring families to the attention. And um, Jazz's question was focused on, so what are some of the elements um, that local GMAR groups can focus on when meeting with uh, DCJ and pushing local advocacy. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a question there about how can local community advocates and what are the tools that are, at, that are at our disposal to try to support change for families that are going through the system right now? And that's just an open question. Um, I'll, I'll have a go at some of this and Alan, Emmy might want to jump in. So I can't see the question on hard law um, and better accountability in the system. So, the, so just a really kind of general response is definitely check out the report because we actually we set out what we think is, um, I mean, um, um, substantive structural accountability, right, with the force of law. Um, so. Um, check that out for some of the mechanisms that we suggest need to be implemented. I mean, um, in terms of the system accountability, so there's many different parts of the system, of course, mm -hmm. but one thing when we look at accountability in people's professions, the only way you actually get really change in culture and practice is to hit people um, at the, at the, in, in the wallet, right? And in the, in, the, in the pocket, meaning, you know, there are all sorts of consequences across all sorts of professions for unethical behaviour, for example. People might um, uh, be demoted and lose income. Some people lose their jobs. And, and this is why in really serious professions, there are professional oversight bodies, yeah, that scrutinise the way in which you, you as an individual practise your discipline in your profession. Um, and there's professional training and there's um, kind of um, uh, a, a scrutinising of, of that conduct. And this is a tricky area because um, of the way caseworkers um, are, are trained, the way, where caseworkers come from, how they enter the system, how they practise, and then how that's um, surveyed. And it's a difficult conversation to have. Um, but... Um, um, there is human behaviour um, that, that, you know, through understanding different regulatory systems, we know how you can change culture in particular professions. And that does not work in this space. There is, there are no, I mean, I don't think my team, I exaggerate all the time in this space, but there's very few consequences for poor practice. I mean, you can remove, you can lie to the court about a family about a child or a young person, a child is removed from their family and off their country. It has this profound impact on them and who they are and their identity for the rest of their life. And there is no consequences for the fact that you lied and the whole world now knows you lied. I mean, it's, it's astonishing and it's, it's outrageous. And I think, and I know, I know it's, it permeates throughout the child protection system um, but when we were looking for really substantive examples of it's really hard for white fellows sometimes to understand what structural racism looks like. And so there are some examples in, in the child protection system where you go, you know what, that's a really A-grade, roll gold example of, of structural racism. This is what discrimination looks like in this regulatory system. And, and we have all of this evidence. It's a plausible argument and you cannot argue back at us on that. So particularly around the court work, 
it's such an outrageous violation of the rule of law. Um, so in this particular, you know, like I said, the system is very complex. You know, there's pre kind of coming to the attention of the system, there's the out of home care, there's it. So, but, but I would say the, the lack of professional accountability right across the space is pretty lacking. Yeah, so that, and that's why we made a lot of really substantive recommendations around accountability, which they're not coming at, right? There are things, it's like the Royal Commission's Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. There are recommendations that can be made by this country to fix the way in which its current legal and political and administrative structures function to help our people and bring fairness and transparency and accountability to our people. Those recommendations all sit in these books and these reviews like family as culture just not being implemented. The answers and solutions are here. They're just not being implemented. So on Jazz's comment about what they should do in the meantime, it is outrageous that those Care Act, that Care Act Review 2024, that is such a classic A-grade example of can kicking by the state. It's completely unacceptable. So really, it, the, all the advocacy should be bring that forward. You know, another four years of children being herded into out of home care and out the other side, it's unacceptable. Um, and I, I just don't think that we should, um, um, we should just accept 2024 as that date. And in any event, I do think um, there, so there's lots of things that have gone, I'm just scrolling back up to the question um, and I know I'm taking up all the time, I'm sorry. Um, so the things that, that you could focus on, I think was, the, was, was, was one of the things that um, Jazz from the Lismore crew, GMAR crew um, raised. And I, again, take my hat off to the GMARs, just, just extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary activism, extraordinary love, love for our children and our young people and just leading the way in change. Um, it, it's slow, but leading the way, everything they have said has been validated. Look, some of the, the th can I just say some of the key things that Al and Emma and I really deeply dis disappointed at, that there's been no traction, is um, the prenatal chapter and the recommendations around the removals of newborns, which is a very large percentage of the removals numbers. It's just unacceptable. That chapter is written with such love and, and care and just deep, profound sadness and anger about the system that removes our babies from mother's arms. It's just not on. That, that should outrage the nation, that chapter. Um, and that is cutting at the heart of our culture, right? Taking a baby from their mother in the hospital. And then all these services complicit in the system, allowing it to happen. And Corey makes that point about the kind of unquestioned gospel of health professionals in this space. Again, unscrutinized. How do we know it's factual? How do we know it's not anecdotal? How do we know that they know the family? We know they don't know the family. We know they don't know anything about the community. So um, I just raised that one set part um, Jazz is a potential thing to focus on. And Alex's point about social work as a profession um, nationally, um, we 100% we agree with that. We 100% agree with that. There needs to be accountability and scrutiny in this profession so there are consequences for shit practice. I'm sorry for swearing, but, but I have to do it as a lawyer. You have to do it as a teacher. You have to do it as a policeman. Everybody has to do it, whether it's ethics or professional accountability for shit practice. And it does not happen in this space and it will change things if it does. People do it because they get away with it and their department protects them and the system protects them. But no one protects our children and our young people and our mums and those families. We're not, they're not protected in this system. Sorry, I'm losing my temper now, but Al and Emma, is there anything you wanted to quickly say that... Um, um, people might want to focus on in terms of the outcomes of the report? Um, I might just add in that just, um, just how important we, f we felt that um, early advocacy work was with families. Um, and just linking that to what Megan was just saying about the prenatal removals. You know, in a lot of these cases, like mums who have had caesareans and their babies removed are doing court in 
72 hours or something like that. There's this kind of, once a child, there's this long period of a department working with the family and then everything just seems to happen at once. There's the removal, there's the, you know, emergency placement, there's the court hearings. And at that point in the, in the child removal stage, it, it's kind of hard to get things organised so quickly. And I just think the earlier um, supporters and advocates and lawyers can be involved with the family. Um, I just think the better the outcomes. And I mean, I know that's, I, I'm, I might be pie in the sky, it's not always possible, but um, if you were going to push for any of our recommendations, the ones relating to advocacy for Aboriginal families and early legal advice, I think are really important too. And the other thing I would add as well is, is looking at some of the recommendations around data and data sovereignty that are in the report. There's this common saying that if there's no data, there's no problem. And I think that that is a really big issue within the department is that there's not a lot of information. And this is something we struggled with throughout the review and the information not being collected appropriately and not being made available to areas where that's needed. Advocacy and pressure around making um, data available and accessible and using that data to advocate for change is something that's so important in the child protection space because you know if, if you can't see some of the the issues for instance the the rates of newborn removals is something that's that's not you know often available it, it, it's really hard to identify and then target advocacy to some of those issues so that would just be something i would add as an area for advocacy as well and thanks everyone and i think um you know certainly in the conversations that i've had with uh, people in the sector and people in the community uh, echoes all of those, you know, they're, they're the things that people have been talking about for a very long time, uh, about accountability, about um, responding early to families and effectively early and doing that planning early and making sure that there's access to the supports and the advocacy that they need, um, but also making sure that communities are actually equipped with the information so that they can make uh, decisions and, and also hold systems to account about what's happening for their kids uh, in their area. Uh, and I know that's a big issue for, for a lot of local communities. Um, I'm very mindful that we're, we're past time. Um, I do want to add my uh, thanks uh, and my gratitude to Professor Davis and the team for um, uh, this incredible review and for their ongoing, um, you know, their strong voices uh, advocating uh, for what needs to happen for our kids. Uh, and, and again, going back to acknowledging the, the community advocacy of, of grandmothers and, and others in the community um, who, who keep pushing this uh, day after day, uh, our community controlled organisations, our legal advocates uh, who keep pushing this. Um, I know that this is the start, uh, well not the start, but this is, as I say, one point in a conversation. Uh, I know that there are questions we haven't gotten to, um, but, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that some of those things around uh, having an in-depth conversation about some of the court processes that might change, um, talking about where the children's court clinic fits in. Um, I think we'll have, you know, there's probably a really good opportunity to do some deep dives about that uh, in the new year. So I hope you all join us with that. Uh, and I'd just like to pass back to, to Carly. Thank you, Paul. Um, Absolutely, in terms of we're continuing to build a really powerful and strong coalition of support and we look forward to continuing to build on this in the year ahead. And um, in terms of thank yous, it, thank you so much to our presenters today, Professor Davis, Dr Gibson and Emma, and also to the UTS Jambana Institute for supporting this webinar. Um, thank you to the grandmothers that have made this possible and who have been pushing advocacy and carrying the load for so long. Thank you to Paul Gray, Shannon Longhurst and Solange Frost for all of your heavy lifting. We know that these webinars do not um, just magically happen. And also a thank you to Jason and Alyssa. Um, the biggest thanks, of course, has to go to all of you for tuning in today and for continuing to stand with Aboriginal communities and our organisations in the fight for urgent systems change to deliver better outcomes for kids, families and communities. Over the coming year, ABSEC and the ALS will continue to prioritise um, all of the reforms. There are four in particular 
that um, we just want to note this is the development of a partnership approach to including government and Aboriginal community representatives to progress the broad ranging recommendations arising from the review to prioritise implementation of the legislative amendments proposed by the Family as Culture Review developed in partnership with the Aboriginal community representatives. The appointment of an independent Aboriginal statutory authority with the powers and the resources to provide public accountability and oversight on behalf of Aboriginal children, families and communities across the child protection system, including child protection and out of home care in order to address the compliance issues identified by the Family as Culture Review and uh, also the commitment of adequate resources, as we've heard throughout this conversation, to um, make sure that the implementation of the review's recommendations um, do continue and with a particular focus, again, on the prevention, the family support and the early advocacy. As Professor Davis mentioned, this should outrage the nation and please um, continue to stay updated on all of our, our work and our collective work and future opportunities to support the ongoing advocacy. Um, please follow the links on the screen and thank you very much for joining us today.